I've never uh, sat down with anybody and had a discussion about my experiences, uh, maybe just a memory here and there with somebody, but uh, I've never tried to put together any sort of a narrative or, you know, tried to, I suppose, in many ways, just uh, let that part of my life just recede the way it naturally would. And, you know, you can't, you can't forget certain things, but... Uh, What is it that led you to, you know, have that sense that it was something that you just, to the extent possible, just wanted to let go of and not really talk about it? Well, you know, I don't think it was a, a conscious decision. Uh, you know, I try to live in the present as much as possible. My my memories are not always that good. You know, even when I remember back to Vietnam, it's, it's not like a narrative. It kind of goes from A to Z to W to L and you know, just certain things pop in as I recall them. Um, I think that there's a sense of some of us, well, I shouldn't talk, speak for other people, but um, not uh, not wanting in any way to glorify uh, what happened, um, not to seek attention because of it, but it kind of a, at the same time, a, a desire to be recognized for the sacrifice. So it's kind of a, you know, struggling with the ego as to how to uh, how to process all this. I've heard from a number of vets that they just felt that talking to you know talking about their war experiences to somebody who had never experienced life in a war zone, let alone combat, that it's kind of a waste of time because there's no way that other person can understand. Is that does that resonate with you at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. You returned from Vietnam. I mean, around the time that I think some of the biggest protests against the war were happening, you you were you returned at a time of really high intensity of the anti-war movement. Did you face any of that yourself? Did you have any experiences, you know, that brought you into some kind of confrontation with anti-war folks? Uh, no, I you know, I certainly had my share of dirty looks and spitting on the ground in front of me or something. But, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't seeking to uh, to get involved in any kind of verbal conflict with anybody. I didn't have an axe to grind. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't, uh, you know, I when I came back, I was also very much opposed to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the action. Uh, you know, I, I, I came to that conclusion after i'd been in vietnam for about six weeks i said what are we really doing here and mm. and later it just seemed like oh you know i saw all the destruction that was wrought upon that country physically to its landscapes and to its people and and uh, and then all of the harm done to my fellow soldiers and it was like you know i um uh, I, I i just felt that uh, you know going over there i you know i was a political science major i believed that this was something in the national interest this this was you know abiding in sort of the, the domino theory of, of the encroachment of communism in southeast asia and so forth and uh, you know the the, the philosophical uh, approach to it, uh, it didn't compare to the emotive uh, um, impact of actually being there and being in that experience rather than talking and thinking about it in academic terms. And then um, and when I came back, I was pretty much just uh, kind of an uh, emotional, spiritual wasteland for a while. My father was a college professor and, mm. you know, uh, life just went along. It was kind of idyllic. And, uh, and it, here all of a sudden something was happening and uh, I sort of, I think I felt at some level that I should be uh, a part of it or maybe wanted to be a part of it. I, I didn't want to go out there and, you know, kill Vietnamese. That wasn't, that wasn't a goal. Um, there was no anger or bitterness about about that. It was just, okay, maybe this was sort of fate. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I actually tried to avoid it. Initially, I knew I was going to get drafted as soon as I graduated. I knew it because that was happening to everybody. And uh, I tried to join the Navy because I thought it would be cool to be a, a naval aviator and fly off 
giant jets off aircraft carriers. That that'd be really cool to learn how to do that. Yeah. And I went through the whole process. And then at the very end, the very last test of it, three days of testing was the colorblindness tests. And I failed it miserably. And they said, Well, you can't be an aviator. Then you can you can come join pararescue and do two years of training and stay in the Navy for six years. And I said, where would I go when I get done? They said, oh, you'd probably go to Vietnam. I said, well, I'll just take my chances with the draft. So you said after, you know, after about six weeks in country, your thinking about the war had, had changed pretty significantly. Um, so I know this is a big question and there would be a lot of different answers. So I'm just interested in, you know, the response you have. What happened in those six weeks what did you see what did you experience that that changed your outlook um about what was going on in south vietnam well i think the, the first thing was just you know when they sent us from the over to be the replacements for the hill 54 debacle and here i was just fresh green guy with just press fatigues dropped on this where this battle had just taken place and there were still bodies all over the place and uh, burned bodies. And, uh, you know, it was my first uh, experience with uh, corpses and, and death. And, wow. and at the same time, there was a pall over the whole place, you know, this, all these guys that survived and their only buddies had died and been wounded. And uh, that's not like they were going to embrace new guys. They were just trying to process this whole thing for themselves the horror of it and the, the and the sadness of it and uh and uh I did, it was just thrown right into that and not into a battle but into the aftermath i think over the next few weeks it was more like also looking at realizing that the the depth and this of a swath of destruction uh looking at the b-52 raids and all the craters and and uh more of this fighting for what and i you know these people were just primarily uh fighting for uh their own sense of nationality they've been fighting the french for decades they, but they didn't like the chinese they they you know fundamentally we misunderstood that this was something that they wanted to do because this was their country not because it was communism although communism infused uh, was was a way I suppose for them to ally with a ideology that gave them impetus to to do something besides what had happened to them over the years. I'm not I'm not saying it, it, there wasn't an element of of coercion and, and and warped ideology through all this, but I think fundamentally it was just at the ground level it's just people trying to live, people dying, horrible deaths on both sides, and I I just it was for me it was just like why why is why do we have to do this and i i don't have an answer to that i just i just felt uh so disappointed and uh at a very deep level of, of what we would do to ourselves and I, I no longer felt like uh i was there promoting a cause how long had you been in country when you went to hill 54 one day Maybe two days. I, I can't remember how long we spent. And, you know, we came into, I think it was Da Nang, I think is where they, we got offloaded. And then we maybe spent a night or two, I don't even remember. And then they just assigned us to places to go. And then well, that's where we went. But when you, when you got on the Huey to go to Hill 54, did you know what had happened at Hill 54? No. So when you're in the air, you you have no idea what had recently happened at Hill 54. No, I didn't know what happened, where we were going, anything. When you were making your way to Hill 54, you didn't even have what I mean I'm thinking of now as a kind of luxury of at least being able to prepare yourself psychologically. Although obviously you've never seen anything like what you're going to see but you can at least go through that process of telling yourself you, you're you're going to see something you've never seen before and steal yourself in that way, prepare yourself to the extent possible. But you're not even given that. You're you're going into the aftermath of a major battle in a state of complete ignorance. You have no idea what's. Yeah. yeah. 
So then to the extent possible, and I'm asking this not to, you know, get into any grisly details or to pry, but um, just to try to just get a little sliver of your experience. I mean, when you first look out, whether it's from the air as the as the Huey's coming down or now the he, the heel is on the ground and you're looking out, when you first see what's what happened, um, I guess, you know, one question is, what do you see? I think you've described a little bit of it, but what do you see? And, you know, what's the impact on you? Because I imagine immediately we have these kinds of experiences and immediately our brain goes looking for some past experience to try to latch on to, to help explain what's happening, but you've got nothing in your background that can prepare you for this. So, you know, what do you see and what is the immediate impact on you of what you've seen? Well, you know, I don't think it was a cognitive experience where I would think through things. It was right. just um, very, very sensor, sensory. What, what I saw, what you could smell, you smell the deaths, you smell burning. It was almost like barbecue, you know, it was just uh, you know, smoke here and there. And, uh, you know, and just, uh, you know, the the sensations of even the uh, the, the atmosphere, you know, this was a human country and it was it was warm and uh you know so all these different things and then looking around and seeing these the, the faces of the of the um uh, soldiers that were there uh, themselves trying to uh trying to cope with what happened uh, it, it was just kind of like a i don't know maybe it was kind of unreal in a way because it was so far removed from my any past experience and then i remember the first the first night, uh, uh, you know, they put put me out on a listening post about it, you know, a click out from the hill uh, with some of the other guys that had been there already. And uh, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, you know, and uh, I didn't know until later that those are the places that had been overrun initially. Uh, mm. So I'm just, you know, totally ignorance. How did the um, the guys who were there, who had been through the battle, how did they respond to you? Um, did you, I mean, were they glad yeah. to see you because they needed to fill spots? Did they see you as somebody who was taking the place of their buddy who didn't make it? Was it a mix of that? or? I don't know. I didn't have any of those kind of conversations. I just thought, you know, it was pretty much standoffish, not in the sense that that they intended it to be, but it was, you know, they were so consumed by their own, you know, just the recent experience. And, uh, you know, maybe there was a sense of, you know, here are these new guys coming in and, you know, do I really want to, you know, get that close to somebody again and, and then they're gone. And, uh, you know, I don't know what their feelings were. We didn't really have those conversa kind of conversations. It's just like over time, working with one another, you know, setting up perimeters, uh, you know, sitting around shooting the crap when things were boring, uh, digging holes, uh, out on patrol, uh, you know, over time, you just, you immerse yourself in one another's experience and you're, um, you, you sort of all come together and see each other's humanity. And I think it, it, that just takes time to, uh, like with any relationship it, it takes time of course but these relationships are forged under a little bit more heat than than most are i suppose when we went out we went out you know echo company was a smaller company the scale down company just had a mortar platoon and a recon platoon i was in their recon platoon but a lot of our operations we were out together both both uh, uh we kind of operated as as a unit we didn't you know sometimes Recon was just the recon, but sometimes we were out with the mortar platoon as well. And, uh, you know, in this particular instance, this this may have been the, the first one. I don't know, because it was, you know, again, kind of uh, not knowing what to do. And I remember uh, Richard Hill was, uh, he was one of our sergeants. And, you know, he jumped over these logs and went out there and put claymores out to kind of give us some defense in, in the face of being shot at. And I just thought, 
wow, this guy's something else, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I know I remember the uh, commanding officer ordered some of the guys to to actually uh, charge the ambush, basically. I know that was sort of a textbook thing you've learned. Uh, well, I don't know that's West Point or whatever not that you, you charge an ambush. Well, that's, you know, that's when you're in an active, you know, you don't have any choice. In this case, we were pinned down, but he sent those guys out. One of them was killed. And uh, the medevac came in and got him out. But uh, there was a tremendous amount of animosity towards that officer by the and this was this were the guys from the uh, mortar platoon side uh from that and uh i think it also in, engendered a, a great deal of anger and hatred uh towards uh not uh, towards the uh vietnamese i remember uh, uh sometime after that uh we had captured a couple of guys and they took them up in a helicopter and it was one of those things that i wasn't there uh, but i you know it was like i'm not sure they both came back a lot of the, the the conflict that I remember was um, sort of around what was called LZ Phyllis at that time. Uh, uh, you know, Quan Loy was a big base camp, but the smaller uh, fire support bases is generally where we worked out of. And I remember LZ Phyllis was, uh, uh, more than any. And patrolling around that area, we had a lot of contact. You know, I remember I mentioned the one with, uh, with Bruce Siebert uh, next to me when we got hit we were kind of spread out in funny ways and we ended up possibly being subjected to our own fire from where we were it was kind of the projectiles coming in all directions and it was just at nighttime and it was just total chaos flashes everywhere and you're just trying to hunker down and um you know i remember somebody setting off the claymore and it hit this vietnamese guy like right around the legs and the waist and he just he was there leaning against a tree just screaming and then moaning and slowly dying and uh yeah i'll never forget that auditory image uh, for the rest of my life of that uh, uh you know what war does right down to the individual person and, and, and even to your enemy and still feeling that compassion and just just uh you know i don't know but just this vietnamese guy um that's a sound you can still bring into your mind you can still hear yeah, just, just him screaming and, the, and then it was it ended and then when morning came around and you know, everything was over him. He was just slumped there, and you could see was he was just basically hammered or from the waist down. And uh, and then we uh, we dug in, and and uh, we got hit again. And um, uh, but uh, there were there were a lot of little skirmishes, yeah, around that time. So I think what I'm picking up from you is that you know we look back on this thing and see this kind of human disaster with a bunch of human beings who are inflicting so much harm on each other and you know maybe there's a sense of oh i don't know whatever the words are you know compassion for that guy even if that's possible but you also said that you know war you didn't use this exact phrase but kind of the idea that combat brutalizes people that you know combat you put young men into these situations and it just has such an impact on them and a lot of vets will say that you know whatever they think about an event like the one you just described as they look back on it they'll have certain thoughts about it but sometimes they'll say that at the moment i was indifferent at the moment I mean, the screaming bothered me, but I didn't feel for that person, which makes sense given the context. At the moment, I was even glad. Um, what was your own, you know, the, the screaming obviously is going to bother you and that sticks with you forever. But what was your own thinking about that person at the time? Was it that that wasn't a person that was the enemy? That was somebody who would who would have killed me or would have killed my buddy. So, oh, well. What what was your own thinking at that moment? Yeah, 
You know, I think I think my reaction was more an emotive reaction. It wasn't a cognitive reaction about I'm trying to, you know, how did I feel about this guy? Or you know, he deserved it because he was, you know, he may have been one that killed one of the other guys earlier, and you know, and uh, we're just, you know, seeking revenge. I, I didn't really have any of those those kind of thoughts. Um, you know, a lot of times I was just scared to death. I was just trying to make sure that, that I'd get through it. You know, uh, you know, other times uh, I was able to just function automatically in the face of things. And, you know, I think there are times when we can all be cowards, we can all be heroes and um, depending on their circumstances. And, uh, and I don't, I don't think, in, in in combat for the most part you, you're not thinking about those things you're just doing what you have to do to survive and to uh, to fight back and then maybe when you sit back later after it's over you can sort of try to process that and everybody i think has their own way of doing that and you know some just react back with anger and you know it's like in a defensive way, and then I can understand why they do that. And, and you know, uh, uh, others uh, may uh, uh, may feel guilty. Um, they may feel guilty that they killed somebody. They may feel guilty that they weren't shot and their buddy was. Uh, I mean, there's just and and you, and you might you'll feel different things at different times that are some may seem diametrically opposed to one another. You know, there's this interesting, um, there's an interesting dynamic that I have heard about, uh, that I've heard vets speak about. So I'm interested, if, I'm interested if this fits with your experience. Of course, you have the, you know, what happens with the new guys. And, you know, normally what you hear is the new guys come in and they're, the reception's a little chilly. Uh, we're talking about in the combat situations, Um the reception's a little chilly, but, you know, time goes on. Maybe they go through a firefight and the new guy, you know, takes his place. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, um, or another aspect is, that's we'll talk about a, a sense of intense commitment to one another. That, you know, soldiers out in the, out in the field, they're not talking strategy. They're not talking philosophy. The war for them is about, you know, 20 feet in diameter, like mm -hmm. me and the soldier next to me. My job is to get home alive and to help the soldier next to me get home alive. And we're both. That's right. Mm -hmm. And at, and then, though, there's another element is that if the soldier next to me doesn't make it, then I've got to let that go and keep going. So I guess one question is, did you, in this experience, you had these six months here in the field, did you feel that sense of intense camaraderie with these other soldiers or intense commitment to these other soldiers? Did you feel their intense commitment to you that whatever this war is about, we're at least committed to one another? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're all in it together. and We all, uh, none of us wants to make a mistake that's going to impact another person's life and uh and some people you get close to and it's like any it's like any group of people you're gonna have people that that uh hit it off that have chemistry with one another you got some some guy that you just don't like and you're never gonna like him you know uh but you're still gonna be uh you're still part of the same uh, experience and you're still gonna you know uh do your best by him whether you like him or not i mean whether you like somebody or not it's not really part of the equation it's just something that that happens and, and you and you have some guys that are you know better friends and you feel closer to than others everybody has this goal was i think the, not how many vc i can kill or whatever it was i want to get home <laughs> you, know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know you'd count the days uh until you could and uh yeah. And for me, I just felt so damn fortunate that I got back to the rear, and that was just this is such a weird occurrence. But uh... well, how did that? How did that work? You're in the field for six months, and then you're you're you have a job in the rear in in uh, for your second six months. 
Um, how does how did that work out? Well, I got pretty sick. I got uh, a gastroenteritis, and I got sent back to the rear to <clears throat> kind of recover from that. And uh, while I was there uh, in Quanloy, I was I need something to do, so I would just take uh, take some of the weapons that had been damaged, weren't functioning, and you know put them back in order. Or, you know take pieces from one weapon, you know, basically uh, make a functional weapon. And then, uh, so I had a couple of those and I, uh, I just had somebody fly me out to where uh, the unit was and they were out on patrol. There's nobody there, but just the, uh, the encampment. And uh, so I was there by myself and uh, this Colonel flew in and I, and Huey, and uh, I guess he was just doing spot checks and checking on his troops and so forth. I'd never met the guy before. And, he just walked up to me and started talking to me and uh, about how I got there and, you know, my education and things like that. And, and he said, you don't belong here. He said, and then, and then right after that, uh, uh, you know, they, they came back from patrol and uh, Swenson uh, went up to the guy and he says, uh, I want this guy out of here. Uh, and, and so I said he's one of my he was one of my better men, and uh, he was really pissed. Um, you know, he had sent me. Swenson had sent me off to LERP school. Uh, you know, was, was a lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was every now and then you could you could take somebody out of a echo type company and and, and send them off to a LERP training. So, you know, he had sent me off. So, you know, I had additional experience that was valuable to the other men and to him and and uh you know he said later he didn't begrudge anybody getting back to the rear but uh from the standpoint of uh you don't want to you want to lose somebody that can can help you out and uh, so he was kind of pissed but uh it didn't make any difference because the colonel had made his decision so i went back to quine Loy and helped set up an order of battle little department there and uh, uh to help uh you know, track movements and so forth. And uh, that's what I did for the last six months. So just keeping track of where different forces were? Uh, yeah, you would just kind of look at all the contacts over periods of time and try to figure out what the uh, what the most common uh, uh, movement the pathways were uh, for the enemy and uh, where we most likely to inter interdict uh, those movements and where to place... Uh, your next mission and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of historically based because, you know, you couldn't be that predictive, but uh, anyway, that's, it was kind of the, yeah. the basis of it. And um, one of the things I remember that I still remember and feel so bad about is that, you know, one night the major came in, I worked at night and he came in and he says, you know, tomorrow I'd like you to give me a, a little small map I can carry. I, I, I can't carry this big thing that's on the wall and I've got a, another colonel or somebody coming with me to fly and i want i want this little i want everything condensed into a small map so uh he left that was my job for the night and uh i thought man i don't know how i'm going to do this because i don't have any small scale maps and all this and then and because i didn't have an immediate solution i got distracted and i didn't do it i completely forgot no, no. and i said so i go back to the barracks um, to to go to bed in the morning and he comes in there where's my map oh crap he says, what the hell did you do all night you know this was a direct order and it was like you know i i, I embarrassed him put him on the spot and uh you know, i still remember that pretty mm. graphically mm. there's that sense of um you know not letting the other soldier down oh yeah absolutely yeah. your work then as a recon soldier who had had lerp training was it similar to the LERPs in that you're going out and observing and gathering information? And really, the ideal is not to get into a firefight, to avoid the firefight. Is that? Well, yeah, sure. That was the whole point of recon, um, whether you're a LERP or whether you're in a recon unit. Um, you know, smaller numbers of people uh, being quieter. You weren't, didn't make all the noise of a line company. You weren't out there to engage in major conflicts. You were out there to track uh, movements, but you didn't shy away from contact uh, if you had to do it you had to do it you know uh um but uh 
most of the time we didn't come into contact with really large scale, you know, division like groups. I mean, we were dealing with small groups like us, you know, just, uh, eight, 10, 20 VC, uh, you know, out there doing similar things, but, uh, mm. How would you describe the VC as an as an enemy? Well, you know, I'm not even sure. You know, you weren't even sure who a VC was. You know, I mean, you could have a, you could go into a little village. I mean, there's some pictures on there of a school that we we went to. A lot of little kids and uh, kids loved us. They get candy and stuff, and uh, you know, uh, you could go into these places. You. They could be uh, Viet Cong, and you wouldn't know it uh, um, until they were f firing at you. You know, the you know a lot of more black pajamas, whether they were VC or not. You know, <laughs> I mean, they were Vietnamese, and so it was just it's just. Uh... But as far as your question, as far as an enemy goes, I mean, these these people were fighting for, I think, for their homeland for their families they were uh up to the task and they were uh certainly as uh as courageous and, and, and as uh willing to engage at a, at a ferocious level that that we were barnes uh barnes uh he was kind of a happy guy most of the time he'd have his morose periods but uh, uh he was very easy to engage with in conversation good guy and he introduced me to uh, to the uh hobbit and the lord of the rings books mm -hmm. and i'd never heard of those and you know that was that was 54 years ago so most people hadn't heard of them but uh i was really grateful for that introduction to the books because they were a, a great way to escape uh the daily affairs just get involved in that fantasy so uh, i have that great gratitude to uh, Barnes for that. And I know that, uh, you know, Barnes had just re-upped to get uh, E6. Uh, so he up, re-upped for another tour. Um, and like I was saying earlier, some of these guys, they didn't have a lot of uh, opportunity back in the States in the civilian world. And here was an opportunity to, to get respect, to uh, get rank. Um, and the best way to get rank would be to be in a conflict zone and, uh, uh, you get ranked faster, and uh, you re up. You get better rank. You get better pay. You get more respect, and uh, so that's what he did. And two weeks later, he was dead. Mm -hmm. And Richard Hill, same. I mean, both these guys were. You know, it was with them. I was with them, you know, day in and day out. And like I said, I had a lot of respect for Hill. He was just a a natural. Uh, he just knew where he was all the time. Didn't need a compass. Just. He was just had this situational awareness, geographic awareness. It was uncanny, and uh, and he was not a well-educated kid. And uh, I think he came from even a poor background. And uh, yeah, again, this was an opportunity. You know, he he had skills that were respected and were valuable and helpful. And and he did the same thing. He re-upped to get E six, and then two weeks later, he was dead. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just a sad commentary that, in a way that somebody has to put themselves at some risk just to be respected or to, uh, to get ahead a little bit. Um, far more risk than most of us ever had to do to, to further our careers, you know. I never told my parents that I was in combat. I told them I was always in a safe rear job. And I would send tapes, little cassette tapes. Of, I didn't write home. I would dictate tapes and send them to my brother, who was three years old than I was. He was the only person that I really told the truth to about what I was going through. So he was my sounding board. And I mm -hmm. was profoundly grateful for him to be willing just to listen and uh, it was nothing he could do. It must've been difficult for him, but. Uh, Did your parents uh, ever find out? Yeah, they found out in kind of a weird way. It was uh, the Lieutenant uh, had written me up for a, an action for, a, you know, a medal or whatever. And, 
and I sent the printed form back. I was kind of I was kind of proud of the way he had phrased it and so forth. And then I realized, oh man, I just <laughs> let the cat out of the no. bag. What, you know. what metal was it? It was just a combination metal. It was so. Uh, it was just something that, uh, again, because of that lerp training, I had pretty good communication skills for the radio, and uh, the radio operator was having a hard time during a, you know, a skirmish, and uh, and so I just uh, brought the, uh, you know, communicated with the Huey and the, the medevac, and brought it in and helped you know load some of the guys on the helicopter and stuff. That and there's no big deal, but it was just something that. Uh, uh, that uh, I, in a way, I, I also told one guy one time, it was, it was nice to be credited with helping save lives rather than take them. How was the Galen Eversoul who flew out of Vietnam in the spring of 1970 different from the Galen Eversoul who had arrived in South Vietnam a year before? Well, uh, Yeah, I think that uh, I was maybe a, a, a sadder person. Um, I was uh, not somebody who wanted to engage in any kind of conflict, even verbal conflict. Was, you know, I you know I stayed away from um, always conflict averse. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to be more of a diplomat and. Uh, and maybe I was already that way, but it probably accentuated accentuated that my whole bent on purpose of life had just evaporated. And uh, you know, I just I had the GI Bill, so I went back to school and I took science courses and stuff that because I had been a Bachelor of Arts person and you know, I just uh, you know, I became over hippie, grew long hair and a beard, smoked pot. Um, you know, made furniture, and, you know, got married. And uh, after three months, I had no business doing that. So it was, it was kind of a, a lost period. And, How long uh, did that go? Oh, I think for years. Yeah. yeah. I think for years. It's important, I think, to to take lessons from those and say, what, what can I do with my life that uh, is not harmful to others, not harmful to myself? What can I learn from those experiences and not to repeat them and to live in a more healthy way, uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually? I think on whole, it, it was certainly a life altering time that uh, it wasn't just life altering as at a moment in time you know it was and i think this is probably true for a lot of us that came back our lives were changed in fundamental ways some good some bad when you look back on that time now that year um what does it all mean to you now so you know, when you go over, you, you know, you're thinking about the domino theory, you're thinking about the struggle against communism. Um, when you're there, it's more of a, it's not now a philosophical struggle, it's a struggle about survival. Um, you get home and, you know, there's a, a new kind of struggle that ensues. Um, when you look back on that year now, what does it all mean to you now? Yeah, well, you know, a lot, a lot of that uh, time period is more proximate in my memory than things that occurred many years later. Uh, that those memories really come to the fore. Uh, uh, certain certain of those memories do and remain, and, and it seems like it wasn't that long ago mm -hmm. compared to other things. But in terms of the looking back on it and the effects on it uh, on me, um, I you know I can't pinpoint any one particular thing uh, per, perhaps uh, you know it was uh, 
it was sort of a it's not all about me kind of a thing um uh, uh sort of a you know a, a shock and a, um you know life is not necessarily just a bit of roses and um uh, you know uh and perhaps uh, the sense of gratitude that i'm here uh and uh not gratitude for the experience per se or for what happened but just um, um you know maybe appreciating um the life and people what would you say is the main thing that experience in vietnam taught you I suppose not to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean not to render judgments. You ha we have to do that in life, but not to uh, not to find fault, not to be uh, not to put somebody else down just to make myself feel better, not to call somebody an enemy because that makes me feel like I'm part of something that's better or different. <laughs> 